with the Australian Jazz Orchestra almost blowing the sails from the Opera House. The Prince and Princess of Wales are on the harbour for the afternoon spectacle. Clouds of balloons fly towards the bridge as Britain's bicentennial gift to Australia, the young Endeavour, leads the parade of tall ships down the harbour. And Gordon Bray is in the thick of things on HMAS Canberra. Thanks very much, Barry, and uh, yes, we're on HMAS Canberra, which is a guided missile frigate, and uh, with me is the director of tall ships in the Northern Hemisphere, our expert commentator today, John Hamilton. Well, John, uh, You've seen scenes like this around the world, but how does it rate? Oh, it's got to be the most exciting one I've ever seen. I don't think I've ever seen so many craft on the water, and I'm happy to say, behaving very well indeed, too. Now, that's very important, because uh, as the excitement builds, when the parade of sail starts, I hope they go on behaving like that, but it's got to be an exciting scene. It's not really going to be a parade of sail, though, is it, because of this breeze? It looks to be southeast at the moment, uh, about 11 knots, so they're going to have to reduce this uh, much sail, particularly with the square rig sails. Yes, that's right. Sadly, they won't be able to set very much square canvas unless the wind changes direction. I hope that they'll set their fore and aft sails, and that will be something to look at. But we can't have it always. When the first fleet came in this morning, they had a commanding wind. They looked grand. So we've been spoiled in the morning, sadly we won't be spoiled in the afternoon as well, I'm afraid. We're looking now at the crew of the Guayas manning the yards in their uh, coloured shirts there, and that's a pretty dramatic sight. And the Guayas, a beautifully appointed craft, what's the accommodation like below? Well, here on board Guayas, I can answer some of those questions about the accommodation below. We uh, actually voyaged all the way up from Hobart. It took us a week, and I must tell you, the accommodation is a little cramped, to say the least. Eleven of us were in one very small, rather cramped bunk. But rather, I should say, rather cramped cabin with eleven bunks. But with me is someone who can tell you more about that, Mitchell and Paul Cantor from the Royal Australian Navy. Now, Paul, you've been on board for a month on an exchange. What is life like on board? Is it tough? Is it hard work? Yeah, there is a lot of uh, hard work. Uh, it is tough in, in some ways. A lot of uh, rope handling. But, but well, now, you told me you've got water twice a day for 20 minutes only for 43 or 63 of you to have a shower. Yeah, well, that is the top bits. If you miss out, you have to live with it. Just try and get the shower the next next one round. And you hope your friends don't mind too much? Certainly not. <laughs> Paul, you've obviously had a fantastic time on board this ship. I've known these people for a week. They're wonderful people. How much has it meant to you being on board here? Oh, it's, it's meant the world to me. And today to see all these, everyone turning out, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. Yes, well, following Guayas is Gorge Fork, the West German boat, a three-masted bark and uh, quite similar to to the Guayas and can I show you a little story about the Gorge Fock? Well it's a story about any of the training ships this is their way of saying thank you to the people of Sydney and to all the Australian ports by means of television to say thank you for the immense amount of hospitality that they've received while they've been in Sydney and in the other ports and it's also uh, important to realize that this is a ceremonial occasion, uh, a saying of thanks. But I remember seeing the Gorge Fock taking part in a parade of sail like this in her own country in Bremerhaven. And I said, when I went on board half an hour later to a cocktail party, I said to the steward serving the drinks, What were you doing half an hour ago? And he said, Half an hour ago, I was furling the royals. And so they have to be able to be up in the rigging there, working the sails, back down on deck, helping to run a cocktail party. 
then keeping watch, steering, so many different jobs. And they're pretty versatile, these guys. The Royal Highnesses are aboard HMAS Cook, which is a survey and oceanographic vessel. Does a lot of civilian research as well for the CSIRO, the universities and the museum. And I wonder if that hat is part of Prince Charles's personal wardrobe or it's a gift from a friendly Aussie. But I'm sure Australians seeing him wearing that famous slouch hat will be very warmed by the gesture. Now we're looking at Asgard. Asgard was shipped over here. Sadly, she couldn't sail out under her own keel because, of course, she has an important training role to do in her own country. And so when she finished her summer season in Ireland, she was put on board a container ship, brought over to Sydney, put back in the water, and the mate and bosun rigged her in three days, and she was able to sail down to Hobart and proudly and right back to Melbourne, I beg your pardon, to Melbourne and then to Hobart and proudly took her place in the race. And you can see quite a large national ensign flying there from Asgard. And there are 12 young Australians on board Asgard too, which is skippered by Tom McCarthy. And look at the clearance. Nipple Maru. Well, she's a four-mastered bark. Yes, um, she's got square sails on the front three masts and fore and aft rigged on what's called the jigger mast. So although she's a very, very large ship, she isn't uh, uh, technically allowed to call herself a ship. She's a four-masted bark. And she's quite new as well, uh, about five years old and very much state-of-the-art square rigger, if you like. She's actually got a performance meter on board so they can tell if they're sailing as efficiently as possible, uh, rather like an IOR yacht. A crew of 155, including 90 trainees. Her home port is Tokyo, and uh, she's regarded really as the biggest and most technologically advanced, as John mentioned, uh, sailing ships in the world. And uh, in her pre-construction, wind tunnel testing and computer-generated projections took place to come up with this superb vessel. She's 110 metres in length, so she's just three metres short of being the longest vessel, but the mast's 50 metres high and just clearing the Harbour Bridge. Hi, James Valentine here on board the US Coast Guard bark, the Eagle. And we're getting a sort of deckhand's eye view of the whole activity here. We just started on the huge wheels that uh, spin the ship around. They sp six of the crew will haul on those wheels and spin it around and up there into the rigging where several hours ago the men were, men and the crew of the US Coast Guard Eagle were up in there preparing the sails to be Hopefully they'll unfurl them all the way for us a little bit later on. And maybe that's the uh, La Bumba that Stuart Scowcroft was talking about. Ah, that's a different way of manning the rigging, but they're certainly not manning their guns. A can-can from the yards there. I think that's the Lewin, isn't it? All the way from Western Australia. She's uh, WA's official sail training vessel. That's a pretty... It's a beautiful shot there of the Nipple Maru. You can see the fore and aft sail. When seen from the beam there, it looks pretty impressive. And here we've got uh, Dar Darmogeji, the beautiful Polish ship. Her maiden voyage was the Karizak Tall Ships race in 1982. She actually took part in a race as her maiden voyage. She's a most magnificent ship. If you have an eye for these square riggers, she has a modern sort of appearance to her. And you'll notice that her yards are equally spaced out, whereas the older ships, some of the yards are in pairs. The lower topsail and upper topsail yards, when the sails are furled, uh, are close together, whereas in the Damojerji, even when the sails are furled, the yards are equally spaced. And in the back behind uh, Darmojerji there, you can see the four spars of the big Spanish ship Juan Sebastián de Elcano. And what a shot, high above the Sydney Harbour Bridge, the traffic flowing past unawares of the majestic vessel passing underneath them. And incidentally, there's not so much room. It's, it's, it's quite a tight fit to get her under the bridge.
from the Polish Merchant Navy, a crew of 134, a fully rigged vessel. And uh, with her masts uh, 50 metres high, they say she's about 16 storeys high of a normal tall building. Of course, that ship has sailed out here. She's far too big to come out any other way. And she started her voyage in August this year. I was privileged to be on board her in Southampton in England uh, to wave goodbye to her. And here I am doubly privileged to be out here in the harbour seeing her sail under the Sydney Bridge. There they are manning the yards. Uh, difficult to say which ship that is. It's not Dharmajeji because you've got the double yards together. We'll see in a minute. Oh, it's the ship Aboman. Very easy to spot with the Sultan of Oman's insignia there on her gaff topsails. That gives me quite a, a thrill of excitement because I was the chief officer of that ship when she was first built. The Juan Sebastian del Cano gives purists a splendid set of arguments. Exactly what rig is she? Because uh, she's one of a, a pair of sisters, the Juan Sebastian del Cano from Spain and the Esmeralda from Chile. And in fact, de Elcano is a Tagalant schooner. So the captain tells us, and he's got to be right. This vessel made her maiden voyage to Australia way back in 1927. And when she was in Sydney, several sailors jumped ship. And one Juan Lopez now lives in Albury, and I believe he's been down to revisit the old girl. Hello, Mum. How would you like that to be your son climbing up the rigging there? Uh, it looks very dangerous. Happily, it isn't dangerous, providing you obey the rules. And this is the whole thing about sailing these huge sailing ships and the small ones. The young people are not in any danger, providing everybody sticks to the rules. He's going to climb up now. In a minute, he has to go over what's called the futtock shrouds. You see him leaning backward and outwards. That is a very scary point he's at now. But he seems to have done it many times before, and I guess he wasn't scared, but I bet he was the first time he did it. You have to lean right back out, hanging seemingly out at right angles to the sea. And the first time you do it, believe me, it's very scary. So the three-masted Bark Eagle, square rigged on all masts, except the aftermast, formerly a German Navy vessel seized by the Americans in 1946 as war reparations, 139 trainees on board and a quarter of those females. So the Eagle sporting the distinctive red and blue striped livery of the Coast Guard and she has now become America's best known tall ship. She held place of honour during the tall ships gathering in conjunction with the Statue of Liberty centenary celebrations. It's rather nice that over the years the captains and the organisers of these events have got to know each other very well. Uh, Ernie Cummings, the master of Eagle there, um, wanted a monopoly set in English. He didn't want the American version, he wanted the English version with um, with all the English place names and so on. So all he had to do was to get onto the STA and we sent him one out there. But seriously, if the masters and the organizers of the event know each other as good friends, then that friendship spreads down through the various levels on board, down to the most junior cadets. And the cadets feel that they'll be welcome on each other's ships because they know that the, the captains are good friends. They therefore feel they can go on board each other's vessels and as I often put it, swap lies about how rugged it's all been. And that's what we're trying to do, to get these youngsters together. Americans, Japanese, Russians, Polish, all the different nations. So many wonderful little nooks and crannies around Sydney Harbour. It really is shimmering in all its glory, but it really has been a day to remember.